We're in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, chapter 8. Ecclesiastes, chapter 8. Who is as the wise man, and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? The wise man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard of the oath of God. Be not hasty to go out of his sight, stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? <coughs> Excuse me. Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Therefore the misery of man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. All this have I seen and applied my heart unto every, every work that is done under the sun. There is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. And so I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of the holy. And they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked. <coughs> and this is where we're picking up from, verse 13. But it shall not be well with the wicked, Neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there, that there be just men, unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men, to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. Then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for that shall abide with him of his labour the days of his life, which God giveth him under the sun. Verse 13, but it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow. Psalm 102, Psalm 102 Verse 11, my days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. Your life on earth is here, you're here for just a short time. The Bible says that our life is very short. It uses some good illustrations for that. We've gone into this before. Psalm 144, in what we've just read, is our life is like a shadow. Here one minute, gone the next. Psalm 144, verse 4. We always complain, saying time goes so fast. This year has flown. This year we've said it's the fastest year we've ever known. I say that every year. But this year is the fastest I've ever known. It's true. Man is like to vanity. Psalm 144, verse 4. Man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. Every day we ought to make count. You ought to enjoy every day. You ought to live every day for God. You're here for a moment. Ecclesiastes 6, 12. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 6.12 For who knoweth what is good for a man in this life? All the days of his vain life 
which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? And then Job 8, Job 8, verse 9. For we inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to search of their fathers. I may have got that wrong, sorry. What have I put? Job 8, 9. It's Job 7, 9. Job 7, I apologise. Verse 9. As the cloud is consumed and vanished away, so he that goes down to the grave shall come up no more. I'll get it right in a minute. It's Job 7, verse 6. Job 7, verse 6. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. We're saying life is so short. Job 8, 9 is one also. For we are but of yesterday and know nothing because our days upon earth are a shadow. The Bible says that our life on earth is but a shadow. It is like a weaver's shuttle. It is like the wind. It is like a cloud. It is like a vapour. It is like a hand breadth. It is like a shepherd's tent. It is like grass. It is like dew. It is like chaff. It is like smoke. Your life on earth is very short. And in these verses, the brevity of life can refer, in these verses in Ecclesiastes, the brevity of life can refer to wicked or righteous. I.e. the whole human race. You are here for a short time. If you live to 70... You've done well. Anything over 70 is like a bonus. God gives us life. God takes life. God is in control of life. He is in control. The life of any man is like a shadow. Job 14, Job 14, <coughs> verse 2. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Your life, you're here one minute and you're gone the next. When we had our Cromwell's day and we went, you know, looking at this great man, um, this great leader, this Christian soldier, a man who stood for the Lord. Here one minute, gone the next. And then we're looking round a house he used to live in. A school he used to attend as a young lad. We go to the battlefield of Naseby and see where he would have ridden his horses. His horse, you know, and his, his troops, his army. Here one minute, gone the next. And now all we're looking at are just artefacts and memories and thinking, here one minute, gone the next. A great leader who led the country and now in just one room you've got a picture of his life. Here one minute, gone the next. The brevity of life. So in this verse here in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 13, it can refer to wicked or righteous, the whole human race. Yet here in verse 13, the wicked, their days are not like our days. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. So from, from verse 13 to 15, as we're going to see, it can refer to wicked or righteous, but in verse 13, it's the wicked here. And it says that their days are not like our days. And the Bible truth is that the wicked man's days are like a shadow. They can do wickedness for a short space of time. And then they are taken so they will not be prolonged. But if they are prolonged, according to verse 12, if they do wickedness for a great period of time, so to speak, in this life, it won't go well 
with them. Look at verse 12 and 13. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him, but it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days. God, we, we did that sermon, didn't we? We um, put that on CD about getting your comeuppance. The wicked will get their comeuppance. They do their wickedness in this short space of life, you know, and it can seem a long time. A world war, you know, 1914 to 18, 39 to 45, 1939 to 1945, doesn't seem long, six years, but if you're in it, it seems long. Your loved one's gone for six years, fighting on the battlefield, you don't know if they're coming back or not, it seems a long time. Yet in, in some ways it doesn't seem a long time. You wouldn't know where I'm coming from. It depends the intensity of the wickedness that you're in or involved in. But no matter what happens, it's not for your best. The wicked person won't come out on top. Never. They'll get what's due to them. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 13 to 15, both cases, i.e. the wicked and the righteous, are illustrated in verse 14. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men, unto whom it happeneth, according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. So the sinner whose life is prolonged and the man who fears God whose life is not prolonged are seen in this verse. We covered in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 15, All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth, perisheth in his righteousness. And there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. They say the, the good die young. That sometimes happens. And the, the wicked, you know, the vilest of sinners seem to carry on. That sometimes happens. But God is a God of justice. He is just. And shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Everyone will get their reward. You will be rewarded accordingly. You see, getting saved, getting saved, becoming a Christian it only solves all of our problems when we are in eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't solve all our problems down here. As a Christian, you still will have trouble. You'll still have problems in life. You'll still have problems with your family, maybe your finances, maybe with your health. You're still going to have problems. But when we're with the Lord Jesus Christ, everything is perfect. The rapture can't come too soon. For us personally, if we want to solve all our problems, all our problems will be solved when Jesus Christ comes to take us to be with him forever. That's it, done and dusted, with the Lord. No hassles, no problems, no health issues, nothing. But at the moment, we've got to go through life with all its trials and tribulations. The rich and ungodly prosper in the world. The Bible tells us that in Psalm 73, verse 12. Psalm 73, verse 12. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Somebody once said this, and I like this. You can tell what God thought about money by the kind of people he gave it to. I like that. Most people with money, they're not godly, they're not pure, they're not holy. Most people. To think what you could do if you were a millionaire or a billionaire as a committed Bible-believing Christian. Imagine that. But people don't pour their money into the gospel work. People pour their money into little empires and to build up bigger empires and materialistic junk. But if you had a lot of money, what you could do for the Lord with that money... 
And at this point, in Ecclesiastes 8 verse 13 to 15, at this point, in Solomon's philosophical excursions, he gives up trying to explain himself. He's on a journey. He's on a journey in search of truth. He wants to know what life's about and he's looking at, looking at it from two points of view as we discussed in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. He had previously proved that things would go well with the man that feared God. So that man would come forth of them all, Ecclesiastes 7.18. But now he has messed up his format. He has seen that bad things happen even to the man who fears God. Now he has come back in a full circle again. He keeps doing this. A full circle from Ecclesiastes 3, verse 13. Ecclesiastes 3, 13. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labour. It is the gift of God. So he's coming back to this again. Verse 5, uh, Ecclesiastes 5, 18. Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labour that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. And here he is in verse 15. Look at verse 15 of Ecclesiastes 8. Then I commended what? Mirth. Commending mirth? I thought at one stage he said it was vanity. Now he's commending it. He's done a full circle. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 2. Well, 1 and 2. I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth. What doeth it? What is mirth? Mirth, we said, is social merriment, high excitement, noisy, gaiety, hilarity, pleasure, enjoying pleasure. So he's come full circle. He's now commending something which he just condemned on his previous search for truth. Isn't it good? Isn't this a good book for today? He's searching out truth. He's looking at, looking at it from different perspectives, different points of view. Compare, I commend mirth, with Ecclesiastes 7, verse 2 to 5. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 2 to 5. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of fe feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of, house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. You see, he's gone full circle. One minute he's condemning mirth, the next minute he's commending it. It's a great spiritual journey for the godly man and for the worldly man from seeing it from two points of view how some trust in the Lord and seek for the truth of God and others are just trusting in men looking to the world. Worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. It's a great journey. It's a great book for today. So when we hit Ecclesiastes 8 verse 13 and 15 we realise that Solomon still has a way to go in his search and he has a lot to learn. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. Then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for that shall abide with him of his labour the days of his life, which God giveth him under the sun. So when he hits verse 15, he's gone back to worldliness, carnality, 
materialism. Isaiah 22, Isaiah 22, verse 13. And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. That's a worldly perspective. That's all this world is living for. Ecclesiastes 2, 24. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. Make the most of every day. Just living for pleasure, the world says. Ecclesiastes 2.24 There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labour. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. The world doesn't realise it's from the hand of God. They eat, drink and are merry, they live for themselves and then they die and go to hell without sorting out their sins before they go. They're living for the present. They're living for the temporal rather than for the eternal. Satan has got eternity taken out of the hearts of men in the sense of he just doesn't get them to focus on things above this life. Tragic, isn't it? You can live your life and miss the whole purpose and point to it. Ecclesiastes 3.22 Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works for that is his portion who shall bring him to see what shall be after him what shall be after him there is life after death Ecclesiastes 5.18 Ecclesiastes 5.18 Behold that which I have seen it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labour that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life which God giveth him for it is his portion we read Isaiah 22 verse 13 And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating flesh, drinking wine. Let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we shall die. But look at verse 14. And it revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, saith the Lord, saith the Lord God of hosts. It was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, saith the Lord God of hosts. You die in your sins or you die with um, having your sins forgiven. And if you are living for today without God, you have missed the whole purpose and point of life. If you are living a life without Jesus Christ, you don't know the meaning of life. And when you die, you will stand face to face with God. And you will be judged according to what you have done with Jesus Christ and if you've rejected him, you will burn in hell forever according to the Bible. Yet you've had a fantastic life here of living for yourself. For 20, 30, 40, 70, 100 years. And then you have, the, you have eternity in the lake of fire and you think that's worth it? Because you're worth it? <laughs> Verse 16, Ecclesiastes 8, verse 16. When I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes. Verse 17. Then I beheld all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labour to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a, ma- though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. These are great verses. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 16 and 17. These verses relate back to Ecclesiastes 3, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. 
He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart. The world is in the heart, not eternity. So that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. And verse 22. Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion, for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him. He's got the world set in his heart, he's got living for today, not eternity. That's all he's interested in, the worldly, carnal man today. So these verses, Ecclesiastes 16 and 17, relate back to Ecclesiastes 3.11, Ecclesiastes 3.22, Ecclesiastes 6 verse 12, 6 verse 12, For who knoweth what is good for a man in his life, all the days of his vain life, without living for God, it's a vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow, for who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? And also 7.24, Ecclesiastes 7.24, That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? So Ecclesiastes 8, verse 16 and 17, let's read them again. When I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes, then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labour to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. Canst thou, by searching, find out God? Can you find out God? Well, the answer to that is, of course, yes, you can. Deuteronomy. You can find out God. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29. But if thou from thence, thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek with him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. But if thou from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. If you seek God, you, you'll find him. Look at Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. If you really want to find God, you'll find him. Jeremiah 29, if you're seeking for God, you'll find him. But are you? Jeremiah 29, verse 12 and 13. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me, and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. It's not a token gesture that is God there. You seek for God, you'll find him, the Bible says. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 6. You want to know the truth? You want to know the purpose and meaning of life? You seek God, you'll find him. You'll understand that the purpose and meaning to life is to have a relationship with God, a personal relationship with God. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. You won't seek God and find God in hell. It's too late then. While he may be found in this life that you are living is the only time to seek God and find him. Because once you've passed on, once you've died, once you've entered eternity, that's it. You'll never have a personal relationship with God there. Not if you've denied him and rejected him in this life, folks. So canst thou by searching find out God? Yes, you can. But, but, you cannot find him out to perfection. You cannot find him out to perfection. You can find him out, but you can't find him out to perfection. If you cannot get complete knowledge of the one who controls what is done under the sun, how do you get complete knowledge of what is going on under the sun? 
You can't. You can't. God knows what he is doing. Man doesn't. No one else knows what's happening, but God does. God knows every single thing that's going on in this world at this point in time, what has passed and what is going to happen. God knows. Man doesn't. Man guesses, man assumes, man makes presumptions. He doesn't know, but God does. Someone has said this, and I thought this was good. If you think you are well enough informed to know what is going on, you don't have enough information. I like that. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 3. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also, the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live... And after that, they go to the dead. The heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. England is an insane asylum run by the inmates, somebody once said. (laughs) That is so true. If we're completely honest, brutally honest, what good has government really done for us, the people, over the last 50 years? What good? What changes? To the betterment of man. The thing under investigation in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 17, is the work of God. That's under investigation. As in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 14. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 14. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Chapter 7, verse 13. Consider the work of God. For who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? And chapter 3, verse 11. Chapter 3, verse 11. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. There is no such thing as knowing wisdom, verse 16, without beholding all the work of God. Solomon is a deist, D-E-I-S-T. And a deist is one who believes in the existence of a God but denies revealed religion, but follows the light of nature and reason as his only guides in doctrine and practice. He's a free thinker. That's what he is. He's a free thinker. That's why it's such a great picture from the worldly man and the believer, the godly man, the person that believes in God, because we see it from both points of view. Not once does Solomon, not once does Solomon imply that there is no God. And not once does he attempt to prove the existence of God. He takes God's existence for granted. And he takes God's rulership for granted. Solomon notes that the business on earth can be so intense and it can run at such a pace, i.e. you're in the fast lane, it's a rat race, that some men lose sleep. Verse 16, 8 verse 16. Some men lose sleep, but also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes. And others who do get sleep, according to Ecclesiastes 5 verse 3, it's still so busy. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 3. They dream, for a dream cometh through the multitude of business. And a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. By multitude of words. Because of the business, the busyness of life. You go to bed and you often dream. And he also says, 
in Proverbs 6 verse 4 that some business needs to be taken care of before you sleep. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. You need to sort out some things before you go to bed, before you sleep. Get the business sorted. And observe how Solomon keeps going in circles. We've said this before. Every time he reaches what looks like a conclusion, i.e. Um, Ecclesiastes uh, 8 verse 17, Ecclesiastes 8 17, Then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work which is done under the sun, because though a man labour to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. Just when he looks like he's hitting a conclusion, he always runs right back to another problem. Sorry, the, the, um, that was verse 15. Then I, commanded, I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for that shall abide with him of his labour all the days of his life which God giveth him under the sun. So when he's coming, when he's drawing to a conclusion, you think he's going to make it, it should have been verse 15, not 17. Then he hits another problem, which is verse 17. And that's what it's like. He keeps, it's going in circles. He keeps reasoning with himself. He keeps looking at things from a worldly point of view, thinking he's made it, then something, bam, hits him again, and it takes him down another road. Man's mind, if he applies human reason and intellectual honesty to live life, you know, to find out life, to, li- to life, to, to seeing all about life, if he applies human reason and intellectual honesty to life, apart from supernatural revelation and the intervention of his creator in his history, he produces nothing when the total is summed up. You see, without God, what conclusions have you? Somebody once said an atheist laying on his deathbed dies all dressed up and nowhere to go. You live life without God and you die. You live life without God. You, you live it for yourself and then you're laying on your deathbed and then you die. And then you stand before God and then you're judged of God and then you're cast into the lake of fire for eternity. Man's mind, if he applies human reason and intellectual honesty to life, apart from supernatural revelation and the intervention of his creator in his history, produces nothing when the total is summed up or computed. Man is not the measure of all things. He is the measure of nothing. Look at Psalm 8. Psalm 8, verse 4. Psalm 8. What is man? that thou art mindful of him. I put in the concordance this morning, what is man? And it came up with six verses. Isn't that interesting? What is man? The number of a man is six. What is man? It came up with six verses. Man is not the measure of all things. He is the measure of nothing. Man thinks he can control his environment. He thinks he can control his destiny, yet he can't even control his tongue. Isn't that true? James 3 verse 8, he cannot control his tongue. He just keeps going on and round in circles. Ecclesiastes 8. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 17. Then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labour to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it out. He shall not find. He shall not find it, yet shall he not be able to find it. Man doesn't have the answers to life's big questions, but God does. And when man seeks God, he finds God. And when man looks for the purpose and meaning of life, God will reveal it to him. If he's seeking with honesty, integrity, truthfulness, honesty.
The answers are found in the following verses. Haggai. Haggai. <laughs> How are we pronouncing that? Haggai, some of you say. Haggai. I'll let you... Haggai. We don't get there much, do we? Haggai 2. Verse 6 to 9. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Not the first time, the first coming, but the second coming. The second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's give a few more verses before we conclude. Psalm 76. Psalm 76. Verse 3. They break, there break he the arrows of the bow, the shield and the sword and the battle. When, you may ask. Psalm 46 verse 9. Psalm 46 verse 9. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. When, you may ask. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. When's this going to happen? Revelation 20. Revelation 20. There's a beginning, folks, and there's an end. And we are drawing to the conclusion. We are drawing to the end. Not just in this sermon, but in life. Revelation 20, verse 1 to 4. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil, and Satan and bound him a thousand years when? and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season and I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. When is this going to happen? Verse 5 and 6. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Verse 1, a thousand years. Verse 3, a thousand years. Verse 4, a thousand years. Verse 5, a thousand years. Verse 6, a thousand years. And, when the, and verse 7, a thousand years. Six times in chapter 20 of Revelation chapter 20 we read thousand years. It's going to happen. A literal thousand years. To be a millennial is, is not even scriptural. These reformed Calvinistic people that think they are biblical scholars that are a millennial don't know what they're talking about. I can't speak proper English. But I understand it says a thousand years six times and it means literal thousand years. I believe what the Bible says, they can be as clever and as intellectual as they like. We had one guy email us yesterday three times, wasn't it? Proud of his reformed theology. Going, running back to the Greek and Hebrew. I just asked him one question. Do you speak it? <laughs> he said no. What are you going to say to people like that? These clever people, these intellectual people. A millennial. Not a clue. Not a clue. Can't rightly divide the word of truth, know nothing about it. So, with this in mind, turn, just again, to, um, Revelation 19, go to Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, down to 16, and in, in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's Jesus Christ, you know that. 
John 1. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords when's it going to happen? you may well ask you know what this world needs? a change of government different presidents no, it needs the return of Jesus Christ. That's what this world needs. It needs Jesus Christ to come and sort it all out. Because man has made such a mess of it. And it's only him who will be able to sort things out. Apart from supernatural revelations, i.e. the word of God, Regarding man's future, man hasn't a clue. Politicians are a joke today. Bring on the divine dictatorship. No doctor, no lawyer, no philosopher, no psychiatrist, no mathematician or politician has any idea about the depth of life, the meaning of life or what the future holds unless, unless, he has been enlightened and illuminated by the word of God. You can be the cleverest person in the world and not know God, you know nothing. Verse 17, we're finishing Ecclesiastes 8. Ecclesiastes 8. Verse 17. Then I beheld all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun because though a man labour to see it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. Though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. This is where the man Solomon is, is in. Verse 16 and 17. He's come full circle. Man doesn't know what's happening, and he doesn't have the answers to. Why? The love of Christ is unsearchable. Ephesians 3.8 The peace of God is past understanding. Philippians 4.7 The ways of God are past finding out. Romans 11 verse 33 And the mind of God is unknowable. Romans 11 verse 34 Though a man labour to seek it out, yet shall he not find it. Apart... From in the word of God. If he's in the word of God, he'll understand about life. You will know more than any psychiatrist or philosopher in this life if you are a Bible-believing Christian. You'll know more about life than any of them, all of them put together, if you're a Bible-believing Christian and you're seeking answers from God in his word. And Solomon knew that 1,000 years BC and man hasn't even worked it out yet. Don't tell me this book isn't up to date. Solomon is searching for the truth from a worldly point of view and from a believer in God point of view. And we get both. We look at it from both ways. Isn't it strange that if somebody is going to teach a false doctrine, they run to a book full of worldliness, like the Jehovah's Witnesses cult, or the Christadelphian cult, or the Morons, Mormons. They'll run to worldly books to try and prove that your soul isn't eternal, that you're annihilated, and they'll keep running to a book such as Ecclesiastes. Deadly to build your doctrine on. But a great book for a worldly person in this life, a man who has tried everything, that you'll never even experience half the stuff that Solomon did, and then he lands on a conclusion at the end of the book. So stay with us, folks, <laughs> until the end. Amen.